Hi, in this lecture, I'm going to talk to you about an example problem from your textbook on the Coulomb force and the potential energy. So this example is problem six in chapter one of Purcell and Morin's Electricity and Magnetism. So let's look at this problem and read it together. We've got two charges, which I'll call little q, and they're located a distance little d from a charge big Q, as shown in the figure. Here I've shown big Q located in the center immediately between two charges little Q. Big Q is in green and little Q is in red, okay? And the distance between big Q and little Q on either side is D, so it's equidistant. Okay, so the problem asks, what should the charge of big Q be so that the system is in equilibrium? That is, so that the force on each charge is zero. Now, the problem notes that this is an unstable equilibrium in that you can picture this. If it's sitting there and it's stationary and then you take little q and you move it just a little bit, say to the left or right or up or down, then that equilibrium will be broken and probably you'll get some charges flying apart from each other, okay? So once you've done the solution for finding big Q, the problem also wants you to show that the potential energy for the configuration is also zero. All right, so when we have our Coulomb's Law um, problems, our first step is always to draw a free body diagram. Now, in this case, you want the whole system to be in equilibrium. So you might be wondering, um, which charge should I draw a free body diagram for? Well, if you think about it, you could draw the free body diagram for either little q on the left or little q on the right, and it would be kind of equivalent, okay? Um, so I went with little q on the left. You don't want to pick big Q in the center because since big Q is equidistant from both little Q's, of course, big Q is going to be in equilibrium. And it's only little Q on the left-hand side or the right-hand side that's going to be your problem, so to speak, okay? So um, if you need to pause the video and think about that for just a second, do so. But I'm going to continue. I chose to draw my free body diagram for little charge Q on the left. Now, in order for the system to be in equilibrium, that, has, that charge has to be stationary. And what that means is that the forces from uh, big Q on little Q and little Q on little Q, those have to be equal and opposite, okay? So there has to be a net force, in other words, of zero. So what I've done is, of course, the, char the force between the two little Qs is going to be repulsive. And that's because since little Q is and little q are like charges, then like charges repel one another. So that means that the force on the little q on the left-hand side is going to be to the left from the little q on the right. Now, if the force on little q on the left uh, from little q is to the left, then that means that the force from big Q on little q has to be to the right in order to keep that charge in equilibrium so that it doesn't move. So that's how I've drawn it here. I've drawn a green arrow towards big Q to indicate the attractive force between little Q and big Q. And I've drawn a red arrow to the left to indicate the repulsive force between the two like charges, little Q. Okay, so that's my free body diagram. Now, step two in any of these problems is to find the magnitudes of your forces that are in your free body diagram. All right, now sometimes you won't be able to find a number, of course, and you'll just have an algebraic expression for your force, and that's okay. So that's what we're gonna do here. Now let's remember that our Coulomb's law expression says that the force in between two charges, Q1 and Q2, is equal to KQ1, Q2 over R squared times R hat. Here, K is the Coulomb constant, which is 8.99 times 10 to the ninth in SI units, which is also equal to one over four pi epsilon naught. Q1 and Q2 are the magnitudes of your charges, and R is the distance in between those charges. R hat is the unit vector that points along the direction of the force. So here we're gonna find the magnitude of that force, all right? Now remember that when we're finding the magnitude of the force, we don't consider the signs of the charges. We leave those out. This is an absolute value, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to let the unit vector, which points in the direction of the force, we're going to let that be taken care of, whatever our signs are, right? Because like charges attract, or repel and dissimilar charges attract, okay? And that will dictate the direction the force points. So 
the force of little q uh, on little q from big q, the magnitude of that force is going to be k little q times big q over the distance in between those two d squared. Okay. Now the other uh, force, which is uh, the force of sorry about this little typo. K of little q on little q, that force is going to be k times little q times little q over 4d squared. And that's because the distance in between little q and little q is 2d. And when you square that, you get 4d squared. So those are the magnitudes of my two forces there. All right. Now, step three for these Coulomb's law type problems is to then figure out the direction that it points and multiply the magnitude that you found in step two times the unit vector okay, for the direction. Now, in this particular case, finding the unit vector is easy, okay? And that's because all of these forces are along the same line. So I'm going to call the x-axis the line that runs through all three of those charges, okay? So it's going to be a horizontal line like so, okay? So that's our x-axis. Now I'm going to say that positive x is to the right and negative x is to the left. So as you can see from my free body diagram, the force of big Q on little q points in the plus x direction, which the unit vector for that is plus i hat. And the force for little q on little q is repulsive, so it points in the negative x direction. And the unit vector for that is minus i hat. So now we're going to multiply the magnitudes that we found in step three times the unit vectors for the appropriate force, and we have our equation for the forces. So the force of little q, force on little q from big Q is k little q big Q over d squared times i hat. And the force of little q on little q is minus k little q squared over 4 d squared i hat. Okay. Next, we find the vector sum of these forces, all forces, to find the net force. All right. So we know that in this case, the vector sum is going to be zero. And that's because it told us at the start of the problem that the system was in equilibrium. So that means that the net force must be zero. Therefore, I would write the equation for this situation as zero is equal to k little q big Q over d squared in the i hat minus k little q squared over 4d squared in the i hat, okay? Now, since everything is in the x direction, I can just look at the x component equation. And then that would give me 0 is equal to k little q big Q over d squared minus k little q squared over 4 d squared. Solving for this, I would add k little q squared over 4 d squared to both sides of the equation. And I end up with the equation that you see here. k little q big Q over d squared is equal to k little q squared over 4 d squared. Now I'm going to do the last unwritten step here. I didn't spell it out, but the last unwritten step is to algebraically solve, okay? And so we've got these two things equated. We're going to cancel out like terms. So that means that we're going to get rid of the k, we're going to get rid of the d squared, and we're going to get rid of one of the little q's on each side. And when we do that, we see that big Q is equal to little q over 4, all right? So that means that the magnitude of big Q is one-fourth of the magnitude of little Q's charge. So we've got the magnitude of big Q in relation to little Q. Now, of course, this just gives us our magnitudes. They would be opposite in sign, as we already discussed. So if I were to write it in terms of uh, the full expression for the charge, Q would be equal to, big Q would be equal to, minus little Q over 4. All right, so that was the first part of our problem. And the next part of our problem said solve for the potential energy um, for this situation, okay? So let's remember the expression for the potential energy of a pair of charges. It's U is equal to KQ1, Q2 over R. Now, in these equations for the potential energy, remember that since this is an energy and not a force, we really do have to go ahead and plug those signs of the charges in from the get-go. We're not allowed to let our unit vector take care of our sign, okay? All right, now, we've also got multiple charges here, okay? So we're going to have to sum over all the pairs. We're going to have to sum over all pairs. So what we've got here 
is we've got a potential energy in between little q on the left and big Q. And we also have a potential energy in between little q on the left and little q on the right. And then we have a potential energy between big Q and little q on the right. All right, so that's three terms. So I'm going to sum over all those three terms here. And what I get are between the little q's and the big Q, we have two terms that are like that. We end up with k little q times big Q, which is minus little q over 4 over d. And that appears twice because there's a big Q in the middle and a little Q on the left and the right. So we've got two terms there. And then finally, our last term is between the two little Q's. And so that gives us plus K little Q times little Q over 2D because 2D is the distance in between the two little Q's. Now, when we uh, simplify that expression, we end up with minus KQ squared over 4D minus KQ squared over 4D plus kq squared over 2d. And as you can see with just a little simple algebra, that is zero. So what we've shown here is that for this system, which is in the equilibrium where the force is zero, the potential energy has to be zero as well. You can see that this should be generally true, that if a system is in equilibrium, in other words, the net force for the entire system is zero, that the potential energy should be zero for that system, okay? And you can understand that if you think about the equation for work, which says the work is equal to the force times the displacement. So if the net force is zero, then naturally um, you should have uh, a net potential energy of zero as the potential energy and the work are related to one another. Okay, I hope that's clear and um, I'll see you in class.